Welcome, my name is Anja Lindbeck. I'm with Local Futures, and I have the honor today of uh, introducing uh, Jane Davison, George Ferguson, and Sarah McKinley. So I'm handing over the word to Jane to kickstart this session. Well, thank you very much, Anya, and thank you so much for inviting me to contribute towards the, the fantastic set of works you've put together for World Localization Day. Six weeks of people in discussion, helping uh, understand what that means and, uh, and what it could mean in the context of any part of the world. Um, I'm, I'm speaking from Wales, uh, Wales, uh, and I know there are a number of people from Wales on the call, so uh, Croeso, uh, welcome to you. Um, and the, I, I live in the west of Wales, and Wales is a small country on the left-hand side of the United Kingdom, um, some three million people and 10 million sheep. Uh, but it is a country that has its own parliament and its own government, uh, which has um, uh, the ability to make laws individually for Wales um, in quite a large number of areas now um, and that, that those powers have been growing over the last 20 years since Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland uh, were given devolved powers from the UK government. I think the real point of my being here today is to talk about one particular aspect of that. Back in 1999, when Wales was first given devolved powers, uh, one of the duties that we had that wasn't uh, uh, given out elsewhere in the UK, and I think a brilliant duty, was we were asked to promote sustainable development in everything that we did. And over a period of three political administrations, it turned out that this was really hard. It was really hard because lots of people didn't understand what sustainable development was, and therefore they didn't know exactly what they were promoting. So by the time I was given the ministerial responsibility to take this forward as required by our founding legislation to set up the, um, the, the Welsh Assembly at the time, now the Welsh Parliament, um, I thought we're going to have to do something quite different here. And I went on a journey um, across Wales, um, talking to people in Wales, uh, working with others across the political spectrum to see if we could make sustainable development the central organising principle uh, for government uh, in Wales. And we had a go at that, um, but I'm afraid that we found that that also uh, failed for exactly the same reasons, that people didn't understand what sustainable development was and therefore they didn't know how to make it the central organizing principle. So what I'm now gonna do is share with you where that journey uh, went to, because that journey uh, has meant that Wales, the little country, three million people uh, off the left-hand side of the UK, if you look at it facing north, um, is now the first country in the world to have legislation to protect the interests of future generations. So here we are, save some for me, uh, a pretty ordinary proposition, but somehow it is seen to be radical, uh, those of us who are actually rethinking laws and policies to benefit future generations. And here is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So over the journey that was taken to understand what sustainable development was, to work out how to deliver it, it became clear that we needed to have very clear goals so that people understood what they needed to do in terms of delivery on the ambition. And also, one of the things that often is not in legislation, but had become very clear through how the previous legislation had not worked, was to have the processes to deliver also in the law. So the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act 
is unique in the sense it's the only act in the world that can deliver on the SDGs. And you see the 17 SDGs around the seven goals of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and the country of Wales um, in, in the uh, slide in front of you. But also in the act are how you have to deliver. You have to think long term. You have to think preventatively. You have to collaborate with each other. You have to integrate the outcomes of the goals and you have to involve people about whom decisions are being made. And these aren't just propositions that are seen as good in the context of Wales. These are actually propositions that come from best practice from the OECD and elsewhere about how to, how to demonstrate good decision making. And this slide actually lays out the content of the goals. So whereas previously in 1999 we were just asked to promote sustainable development, now you can see how you can do it. The Prosperous Wales goal, I'm not going to read them out, but you've got them in front of you, but just to highlight a couple of points of each, is innovative, productive and low carbon, working within environmental limits and allowing people to take advantage of wealth generated through securing decent work. So you can immediately see um, a very different proposal for a country, a country which could not open a new coal mine and deliver on that definition of prosperity, wants a skilled and well-educated population in these areas. Resilience, I much prefer, I wish this was called the nature goal because it would be much clearer to people, but it's not just about maintaining, which of course nobody is doing, including Wales, but enhancing the biodiverse natural environment. Um, and dealing with climate change, uh, the prosperity is linked to climate change. Health, not targets like how many ambulances come and pick you up, but what does it take to create a society where people's physical and mental well-being are maximised? And how do you understand what choices and behaviours can contribute towards that? So it's about instead of looking downstream and short term, which is what politics has become pretty well the world over, it's about saying, let's look back, let's turn this on its head and how we can therefore create a different kind of society, more equal, irrespective of socioeconomic circumstances, <coughs> but also in the context of race, gender and any other protected characteristic. How you, how you build cohesion in communities, very important in terms of World Localization Day. And although it's a very short goal here, you know, we all want to live in attractive, viable, safe and well-connected communities. But actually the communities in Wales, in a rural nation, are not well-connected. And that's both about broadband, but also about transport. What kind of new and exciting opportunities can be created? Because we're a country of more than one language, um, uh, in terms of our main languages, uh, English and Welsh, and both are protected and both are main languages in Wales, but we have many other languages as well. And finally, in the context of globally, global responsibility, not doing anything that will affect uh, the world negatively as a result of what happens in Wales. And that's a really, really important goal in terms of making sure that we don't pass our carbon emissions or anything else on. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I do apologise. I said a moment ago that also in the Act are the processes, how you have to work in terms of delivery. And that means that when you think of those five factors that I mentioned that are there on the screen in front of you at the moment, you now also have in Wales three main um, individuals and organisations that are able to hold all the public services in Wales to account to deliver. And that includes the Welsh Government, because one of the things that was really important to me is this wouldn't be a law that government would pass for everybody else in Wales, but Unlike normal laws that government does pass for others, not itself, this also affects the government itself. So a few, an independent future generations commissioner can challenge all those public services and government. The Auditor General for Wales that audits all the public bodies can challenge. And of course the courts, because it's a piece of legislation, can also challenge through judicial review. 
And I wanted to bring this back to the idea of localization. If we go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs back in 1943, you know, just before, uh, in, still in the middle of the Second World War, I fundamentally believe, and actually the government in Wales fundamentally believes, that government has a critically important role in making sure that our physiological and safety needs are met before actually those issues around friendship, intimacy, family, sense of connection, moving up through respect, self-esteem, recognition, status, and up to being the best that we can want to be in the world. None of those things can happen unless government creates the right conditions. And those conditions um, are about clean air, access to clean water, making sure there's enough food, making sure people are sheltered and housing is a critical issue in the UK at the moment, making sure that people can have interrupted sleep, they have access to clothing, making sure that they are personally safe, uh, that they have access to employment, etc. All these things, including health, government has a fundamental role in. And I think in many ways, governments have moved away from this. And by moving away from this, they have let people down, particularly those people who are most disenfranchised. So the story of what the, how this journey was taken from the very first ideas of having legislation to promote sustainable development, which was not enough, to having legislation to deliver on the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act with mechanisms in place to hold to account. And um, the big test in Wales at the moment, and I think particularly in the next five years, will be the Act is now five years old. It was implemented for the first time a year after it was passed. All the public services were asked to create plans. We're only now into the second set of plans. And what is really interesting is how people are realizing that what they did before is not enough. And um, I wrote a book about this because the lessons from a small country are about place-based policy, local regeneration, foundational economy. It's about how to make the country better for the people who live in it by behaving responsibly both to those people and to the world. And what is absolutely fascinating in the UK is that the Scottish government put it in their manifesto to deliver similar legislation uh, in Scotland during its a new administration. And in England, uh, the government is not yet on board, um, but there are moves afoot by members of the UK Parliament to really take this agenda forward. And the point about the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, if we just go back uh, to those relationships between prosperity, between uh, nature and health and equality and cohesive communities and vibrant culture and global responsibility, is they are a jigsaw. And unless we integrate our responses to all these areas, then we don't get the maximum benefit. And I want to operate to the principle, do unto future generations what you would have had past generations do unto you. And I finish with just one example, which I put in the book, which is absolutely about localization. It's called Skyline. You can look it up um, uh, under that heading Skyline and Wales. And it's about the South Wales Valleys, which provided coal to the world, where people's health was destroyed, where the capital was taken out of Wales, the money was taken out of Wales. Um, but those people who created that wealth for others stayed in long, narrow valleys where coal was the reason that they were there. And for many years, governments have tried to find ways of really regenerating those valleys. But they've always done things to the communities, not the communities deciding what they want. And under the Skyline project, three communities in three of those valleys are actively looking to take control of their own land in perpetuity, delivering outcomes linked to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which will then be a localization model, which I hope will be replicated uh, in other countries too. So this is still a very, very early days, but this joined up approach is absolutely essential to deliver better outcomes.
for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jane. So inspiring, I'm already thinking that I need to do what I can to get similar legislation through in my small country, native <laughs> country of Denmark. So uh, I'll hand over to George for the next. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Anya, and thanks, Jane. Um, it's wonderful to follow Jane. I have huge admiration for what you've done in Wales. And um, I, I'm sitting in the city of Bristol, which is a stone's throw from Wales, just over the bridge. And um, I think uh, you have taken localism to uh, a new dimension and um, linked it very strongly with the environment and health and, and, and the um, future well-being, well-being of Future Generations Act, which I think is inspirational for all countries. And, um, it's probably up level with the uh, Bhutan's, uh, the Bhutan's uh, happiness uh, movement. And um, so thank you for that. Um, so I was um, mayor of Bristol for, for near four years, a bit less. And uh, I, uh, Bristol is a city of half a million. It's got a city region of about 1.2 million. And you cannot really separate a city from the region in which it sits in terms of sustainability. I mean, a good city, what makes a good city? A good city must be one that um, benefits its surroundings rather than uh, creates poor impacts for its surroundings and poor impacts for the world. Um, therefore, a good city must in theory, generate its own power. It must uh, deal with its own waste. In fact, get rid of the term waste. Think of resource rather than waste. How do we reuse everything? And um, so I have some hero cities in the world, um, one of which is Copenhagen. And yeah, I think it, it's a city that has taken the environment and sustainability really seriously. Um, so when I became mayor, I was absolutely determined that we moved away from this quite destructive society that we have of everybody driving around in cars, using more energy than they generate and, um, and, and making unhealthy environment for children to grow up in, um, dangerous in many, in, 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 in many ways. So, a good city must take control of its own future. And um, we had the Localism Act in this country in 2011. And the Localism Act, I think, um, has benefited regions. Uh, it's benefited Wales in that they have been able to take more control of their own future and their own policy. But when it comes to cities, I think it's been pretty nominal, um, the change. Um, that. Uh, the, the mayors that came out of localism uh, were able to create a certain amount of, yeah, had a certain amount of power, but it was soft power. No tax raising power, no additional. So very little of the, um, of the things that local authorities do are they in real control of because they're not raising their own taxation to a degree that means they're in control. So when it comes to housing policy or uh, transport policy or food policy, um, they're often begging from central government for the support that they need in order to um, carry out these things. So where do you start? You start with vision. You have to have a vision that is similar to the one that Jane has described about the future. That vision has got to be about the future and politics is incredibly short term um, in its thinking. We have elections every four years in typically and getting politicians to look beyond the next election is always an extremely difficult thing to do. 
And I think it's worsened by, um, by central control. When local communities take control of their own futures, they, it is a much more personal thing and therefore that there is much more care taken about the, uh, about the environment and the health of that community. So creating a vision for building, for building homes, for building communities, um, in, when, it's, when it's top down is often all about numbers. When it comes from the community, it's much more about quality. It's about what sort of world do we want? What sort of community, what sort of neighborhood do we want? And therefore, um, the uh, local policies for, for building a community, which is not just about the fabric, I may be an architect, but I care much more about what happens within and around buildings than the, than the buildings themselves, um, has, to be, uh, has to belong to the whole community rather than be something that is done to it. Mobility is another policy that has a huge effect on people's lives. Our, car, our cities and communities are in many ways destroyed by the domination of private cars. And it is extremely difficult for politicians to deal with that issue um, because people hang on to their cars for dear life. But actually that hanging on to their cars is a, a huge problem for local cohesion, for the use of our streets, for what they should be is the hearts of communities and in, instead of just parking places, they should be for our children to play in rather than to be threatened in um, by, by, by big dangerous vehicles. And those things can be seen when a, when a, a community can, takes control. And the third policy issue I'd like to talk about is food because we have a madness in this world where food that is grown around our cities is largely exported to other areas either within the country or even outside the country. We have the domination of huge supermarkets that buy up the food from the, the farms surrounding the city. And while it's absolutely natural that most of that food should come into the city, should serve the people who live in and around the city, and that the waste that comes, the enormous waste that we need to reduce, um, should return within the city region, within the surroundings of the city, um, to, uh, to enrich the earth that produces the food. So if you had a true local economy, a true local circular economy, where people are making those decisions for themselves rather than big corporates making the decisions, sometimes more powerful than governments, um, then one would have a much healthier existence. Um, we would have cleaner air. We would have less transport uh, going both across the city and between cities. Um, we would have safer cities where people could walk and cycle um, with the knowledge that they were unlikely to be damaged in the process. Um, we would be able to do um, we'd be able to take away a lot of the space that is tarmac, that is uh, car dominated, to use for events, for, for, for celebration of, 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 um, of local things, for markets. And um, I sometimes feel that the prosperity has made us worse. And that I look sometimes to the poorer places that have more enriched communities out of need and think about how we can learn from their, 
from their communities, not to copy, but to adapt. Because the great thing about localism is that localism should be about the local culture. It should be about the local character. It should be about the local place. And it should be different. And wherever you are, you should be able to recognize that difference. And the terrible thing about globalism is that we all copy and don't adapt. And we end up with cities that look and behave much the same. So to get back to the vision, the vision must be of reinforcing the character of the place you live in, of putting the people who live in that place first, of giving them the decisions about their own future and ensuring that we, we make and grow and use things for, you, for, 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 for local people and that we minimize the waste and we return things to the earth to enrich it, not to destroy it. Thank you so much, George strong words. Uh, I'll hand over to you, Sarah, for more good stuff. Thank you, Anya, and thank you, uh, Jane and George. It's, it's a real honor to be a part of this event, um, uh, which I think is a really important um, topic for us all to be discussing and grappling with. Um, and I'm really honored to be a part of this uh, panel um, and hearing from my esteemed colleagues, I've, I've long followed the work in Wales and the Future Generations Act, um, as well as the, uh, the work that George has done in Bristol and beyond. So um, I'm really honored to be here. Um, I've asked Carly to, to share my slides. I've had a little bit of tech difficulty. So um, I thank you very much, Carly, for, for stepping up. Um, and I'll just let you know when to, to move on to the next. Um, and you can go ahead and do that now. So thank you. Next, first slide. So as um, Anya said, my name is Sarah McKinley. I'm director of European programs for the Democracy Collaborative. Uh, the Democracy Collaborative is a US-based research and design hub for the democratic economy that advances new models and visions for economic democracy on both sides of the Atlantic. So what do we mean when we talk about economic democracy and why is that important? We've already heard from, from George and Jane a bit about this and I'm gonna, go from sort of this really visionary and um, high level inspiring thinking um, to some concrete examples of how communities are taking control of their own futures and their own economies. So right now, um, as we all know, ownership and control of our economy is concentrated to degrees that we have not seen since before the Great Depression, concentrated in the hands of an ever increasing few who extract wealth and resources from our communities, destroying our planet, and breaking our bodies, and particularly the bodies of, of those black and brown um, people throughout the, the world. We cannot have a system that is half democratic and half plutocratic. We see it already. Our plutocratic economy is eating our democratic politics. Democracy cannot reside only in the political realm. We have to democratize the economy. And to do that, we need a revolution in ownership changing who owns and controls capital and productive assets in place so that we're not just tinkering around the edges of a destructive system, but fundamentally restructuring our system so that it not only works in service to community, but actually produces positive outcomes by its natural functioning. Predistribution, if you will, rather than what we're doing now, redistribution. Next slide, please, Carly. And we believe that we can do this starting locally through what we call community wealth building. Community wealth building is a system changing approach to place-based economic development. It produces broadly shared collective economic prosperity through the direct reconfiguration of our economic institutions and local economies on the basis of greater democratic ownership, control, worker participation, and community control. Next slide. 
So there's a lot in that definition I understand, and we're actually working to streamline and make that more, more usable. But what you really need to know, the key to understanding the transformative capacity of doing community wealth building in place are the principles of ownership, place, institution, institution building, and system change. So as I said before, it's not just about tinkering around the edges. It's about overhauling our local economies from the ground up so that they are thriving for the people who live there. So to create a thriving local economy requires designing institutions from our local governments to our enterprises and beyond so that they are locally owned and controlled and the economic advantages of that ownership are spread broadly and the resulting wealth is not extracted to benefit just those at the top. In other words, the wealth stays local and recirculates in the way that we've been talking about already. And we can do this through various design and rooting it in place, not in sort of this financialized, abstracted economy that we currently live in in, in our globalized world. Uh, next slide, please, Carly. So what does that mean? This can take many forms from employee owned cooperatives to municipally owned enterprise to community land trusts to local development finance um, and, and beyond. Many of these initiatives exist already in your communities and in places across the world, from Chile to Amsterdam, Cleveland to the UK. Imagine, however, if these efforts were well connected to local economic engines and levers of power like government and health institutions. Imagine if they were intentionally linked to the explosion of local solidarity and mutual aid efforts that we're seeing across the globe in this moment of crisis. Imagine if there was supportive regulatory and legislative frameworks around these efforts that provided abundant resources to increase community capacity and to engage and, and lead on their own. Then we really truly could build back better from this moment, preparing ourselves for the compounding crises that are ahead of us from climate change and, and, and beyond. Then we would really see new political economic systems starting in place and building to the level of a full system change. Next slide, please. The good news is this, this already exists. There are examples of this in place. For example, in Cleveland, Ohio, the Evergreen Cooperatives are a large network of green employee-owned cooperatives located in disinvested, largely African-American communities in the center of, of Cleveland. These cooperatives were deliberately creative to, created to supply goods and services directly to the hospitals, universities, and other large anchor institutions of the city. Institutions that are rooted in place and are not gonna go anywhere, unlike most of the uh, multinational global corporations to which many local economies are dependent. Today, the three evergreen cooperatives now employ over 200 people locally, all of whom earn a living wage and have the opportunity to share in the profits of their company, as well as make decisions in the way that they are run. Recently, the cooperative Laundry beat out Sodexo for the full laundry con contract for the Cleveland Clinic, the largest hospital in the, in the region. And they were able to buy out the Sodexo plant, converting all employees to owners and giving them immediate raises. There's now a fund to support the conversion of other locally rooted businesses to, to employee ownership. And you begin to see an opportunity to scale and, and really distribute the economy in a way that, that benefits those who are living and working in place. Next slide, please, Carlin. You also see this in Preston, England, a small post-industrial city in, in the north. The city government worked in partnership with local organizations and institutions and have been able to repatriate over 100 million pounds in local spending um, to local enterprises, um, recirculating that money in place. They've invested their pension fund to support local housing and social housing and are in the process of relaunching a local mutual bank and a network of unionized employee-owned cooperatives. This is just part of an integrated strategy to reroute um, their economic output locally in the community. And they're doing this in the face of austerity and, and growing crises just by, by working with what they already have, but, but thinking of it differently and redirecting it. So these are just a few examples. There are hundreds more and many, many more in this, in this era of COVID. And they produce positive impacts daily in people's lives. And I'd be happy to speak more about that in our, in our conversation coming up and with, in your questions. And they're really making change for people in place and, and for the environment. But in this moment of crisis, we must connect 
resource and grow these efforts so that they can meet the scale of the demand. We must connect them to efforts like you're seeing in Wales with the Future Generation Act, like you're seeing in Scotland with, a, with new supportive legislation for community wealth building explicitly. They've even appointed a minister for community wealth building in Scotland. So we must really resource and support this work in a powerful way that, so that we can move these efforts from the fringes to the mainstream as our new normal and main means of rebuilding our local economies. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, I was looking forward to this and I got just what I wanted. <laughs> so uh, I'll uh, hope that you can all, are you all on screen? Yes, you are. That's brilliant. So we've got like about uh, 20 minutes for a, a bit of a conversation now before we go into questions. And, and um, I would like to sort of hear a bit more from all of you about the kind of specific legislation. Obviously, we've had some examples here. The best one, or, or the first one being um, the, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But I'm also thinking of other legislation that can help as you were saying now, Sarah, this kind of supportive regulations that can support the efforts, all these amazing regeneration that's already happening, you know, uh, and, and allow those to flourish. That's the one thing. So if you can think of anything specific that you want to share, any specific regulations that you think are real key, I mean, uh, to my mind springs something like public procurement or something that can create change very rapidly. Um, right, can that, I do <laughs> Um, there's, I think what was really interesting about Sarah's presentation um, is that actually the Preston model, the incredibly important part of the Preston model, is how they used procurement um, and are still using procurement in terms of um, you know, contributing to what we in Wales call a foundational economy, but bringing the money back home, making sure there was local economic benefit. And in Wales, through the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, then and also um, uh, looking at the Social Value Act, which applies across the whole of the United Kingdom, you get through some of this legislation permission to think differently. And what Wales has now done is totally changed its procurement mechanisms um, because it wants to deliver on the aspirations of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And the, 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 uh, the bit about procurement is particularly important. And I'll just give you one example of a localised project that actually links over to the work I do with the Food Farming and Countryside Commission as well. Um, in the uh, Carmarthenshire, which is a local authority area in Wales, in, in, in West Wales, is also, because of its placing and relationship to other local authorities, it has a university in it, a, um, uh, a college in it. It has the, the headquarters of the West Wales Health um, uh, in it. Uh, it has a major police headquarters in it, etc. So it is a very much a regional headquarters. So I was able to propose that we should actually look at public procurement in terms of changing what went on to the public plate. So if we got all the public authorities, uh, the council, the police, the university, the college, the, have the health board, natural resources, Wales and others, all to procure together around food. Now, some of us procure quite a lot from the university sector and the college sector. Others, such as the police, procure very little. Health procures an enormous amount. Local authorities procure an enormous amount, particularly in the context of schools and, and care homes. And I thought if we could get all the procurement lined up, we could create, and this is very much linked to the Preston model, we could create an opportunity where we were creating healthier food create new opportunities for growing, because only 3% uh, of Welsh horticulture, i.e. fruit and vegetable, is grown in Wales, which is nonsensical, because it could very easily grow all of it, since all of the 3% is grown on 0.001% of land. So if you want to do, you know, literally, um, if you had 3% of land turned over, you'd get 100% of the need, and then it could be used for other things. So how can you take that localization approach at a local authority level um, and get all the partners in play? Now, the Wellbeing of Future Gener Generations Act demands 
in every local authority area, a public services board that is all those authorities that have to work together on outcomes that benefit that place. And although there are, there are all sorts of issues about how well or not that's working, the principle is a brilliant one. And it has meant that, that this kind of proposal are now, is now being looked at. We get conversations from all over the world looking at this proposal of using procurement to drive an outcome locally where all partners engage in the procurement process and use that, that, that critical mass. And we featured it in the field guide to the future <clears throat> in terms of the uh, Wales report on food farming and countryside commission because the ambition of the commission is to uh, create an agroecological approach um, and my role is not I'm, I don't lead for the commission I lead in inquiring into whether the commission is doing the right thing <laughs> so I lead the Wales inquiry and test whether or not the commission is actually doing what it needs to do in terms of uh, giving us uh, in Wales appropriate advice but it's such a good example so it's place-based it absolutely deals with the issue of food that George highlighted it's linked to the Prince Preston model that Sarah highlighted and it uses procurement and I know that George did amazing stuff in his time in, in Bristol so perhaps I'll hand over to him. <laughs> well yes I talk about the power of procurement because I think there's huge amount of power in the hands of the procurers and sometimes a real um, misunderstanding about what they should be doing. Um, because, um, you know, we should always be thinking about best value rather than cost. And best value is about the, how that procurement can redistribute the benefits within the community um, for which it's procured. And um, so, I think it's not just about the legislation, which is important, which should be quite liberal in terms of the power it gives to the local people to be able to procure locally. Um, but it's also about the understanding of the people that are, are carrying that out and being able to evaluate um, the, 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 the true value. I know that sounds... Uh, uh, that sounds a stupid thing to say, but I think there's a, a lack of understanding of the way that money can recirculate within the local economy um, if it's procured correctly. And also sometimes procurers thinking that big is good because it, they think it's safer. And often you can put small suppliers together to work as a community of suppliers um, from the local community that can compete extremely well with the big suppliers that may be more remote. So um, I think it's a combination of liberal legislation in terms of procuring and the um, understanding and the ability to take a few risks. Um, I think it's, it's risk-averse procuring often leads to very bad decisions. And I'll, I'll just um, continue with this theme of procurement. There's a lot there. I mean, there's a lot to be said on, on legislation broadly, but of course, procurement is a key part of this. And I mean, I'll just say, you know, ultimately, we, we do need to change our, our global legislative framework around um, procurement and particularly those who are impacted by EU procurement law. It's a big problem and it needs to be changed. Um, and we, we absolutely need to change that. That said, there are things that places like Preston are able to do even within those legislative frameworks that, um, you know, are much more, in, uh, much more oriented to favor sort of multinational companies than they are any other. You know, places like Preston, what they were able to do was break up their contracts into smaller amounts. Um, not only does that then um, make it... Uh, 
it, it doesn't put them at odds with EU regulation um, if it's under a certain amount, but it's also easier for smaller um, enterprises to actually go for and fulfill those, those contractual needs. So, so there are ways um, to work with that, but, but ultimately um, we do need to actually change the, the legislative framework that actually favors um, you know, saving, you know, the, the price per unit being the cheapest rather, rather than actually taking into account. And to George's point, understanding the actual full costs of, of procuring and purchasing in certain ways. So just to take the example of Cleveland um, with the laundry, which was the first cooperative that opened there, we looked at the way that the institutions operating in Cleveland were procuring their laundry with multinationals. And what they did was their laundry services. Um, they, they worked with a large GPO, a group purchasing organization that aggregated laundry from all of the hospital facilities and others in the region, and then took it all together and shipped it to Mexico. Why? Because in Mexico, they could get the cheapest price per unit on, on the pound um, because of, um, unrestricted labor laws and, and exploitation. What they weren't factoring into the cost actually was the cost of shipping. They didn't even actually factor in the cost of shipping, let alone the cost of the externalities, both environmentally and in terms of service disruption to the hospitals. So there's a snowstorm in Cleveland, you can't get your laundry into the hospital. That's a big problem. So when you start to actually quantify those costs and, and consider them as part of the cost, you're actually, from a business perspective, looking at something entirely different than, than the way we currently envision um, these impacts. So, so there are ways to, to think about these things and talk about these things in ways that, um, that make the case um, for a lot of this legislative change, um, in addition to all the very obvious sort of environmental and community sustaining aspects of, of doing things differently. Uh, Jane already spoke to the, the importance of a social value act. Um, that needs to happen in many more places. Wales has really um, led with that example. Um, but then there are lots of other sort of legislative frameworks, including things like regional investment banks and, and things of that nature that can really support these kinds of efforts in, in place. Um, and actually, uh, with our partners at Commonwealth, we, we recently um, put forward a, a series of recommendations for legislative um, change that would support community wealth building and economic democracy in place. I'd be happy to share. That. Can I just add one other thing that relates to what George was saying about communities of suppliers? Because I think that this, this has been really interesting. I mean, George also pointed out that procurers um, are often very risk averse. And that risk aversion um, uh, often manifests itself in demanding almost impossible hoops for people to go to. So your point, Sarah, about you end up with the multinationals and they become multinationals because they see that this is the way people work and therefore they procure. And so you end up with the big organisations winning all the contracts when they can't deliver apart from with casualized labor with no expertise specific to the procurement um, outcome and i think that what you can unpack at a place base and that's been what's so interesting about the preston model is i don't think that what i and, and um, a procurement expert first proposed to Carmarthenshire and they, they picked up and they completely run with it. It's, uh, you know, I was part, part of the initial proposal, but I'm not part of the, of the outcome. And I think what's been really interesting about this is that it was the Preston model and, and Claire's um, uh, in terms of the reporting and understanding of policy and being able to give an evidence base to outcomes that then gives a public body confidence to change the way they look at risk. So the evidence base and good, a good evidence base that is intelligible to the public body is critical to give them kind of cover with their local community in the context of taking some of these kind of risks. And then you find um, that actually you can, ch you can do what you want with procurement um, if you are really clever about doing it. And what has been absolutely um, uh, eye-opening is that, you know, I agree that there are some aspects of the European procurement system which um, it would be very useful to change, but we also know it's they're delivered quite differently in different countries in Europe. And Britain was always the most risk averse. <laughs> 
in that context. And ironically, that uh, we're now be, we're, you know, we're now being told that because of Brexit, um, that actually we can change the procurement frameworks. But what we're doing in Wales is not changing a procurement framework in any way to anything that we couldn't also have done before. And I think that's the other point is that we're not getting any benefit from Brexit in new kinds of procurement. I just thought it's important to lay that out there. But we, what we are getting the benefit of is having, as George says, an overarching vision. And that then means that we get the permission to think differently. That means people can think differently. And then you find very, very active people in organisations who are really prepared to change the way they do things once they've got that permission. So there is something about place making, making in that context, I think is also really important and giving people confidence. I absolutely agree. I just want to come in with one little provocation and say that I, it may not just be that, that places like the UK and, and others are, are risk averse so much as perhaps captured by, by certain, um, you know, powers and, and industries and, and corporations that I do think very much uh, set the agenda deliberately in order to direct things in one direction to their favor than to others. So, yeah, I think, I so think yes, it's both, I it's both, but I don't think it's only that. <laughs> no, but I was gonna say, but I think that that's where, what is interesting is that it's Wales and Scotland that are going down the different routes as the small countries in the UK. And there's the point, the small lessons from small countries can be lessons to big cities. Big city lessons can be lessons to small countries, um, et cetera. So that whole notion about identification and place and particularly that interrelationship, which actually I didn't, I didn't say, but actually it's critically important here in Wales, is, is having that interplay between uh, environment, society, economy and culture. And those four elements are built into the pillars that underpin everything in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And culture is critical because that, that is about issues around identity and place and belonging. And all of this is about belonging. Okay, so we've got a, a host of really interesting questions, um, so which I'll uh, shoot into so that we have the time. I, I want to thank you for what you've just been sharing now that I've got lots I would love to add but I won't take the time up with that only to say that I think all I think local government in small countries as in the case here with you mentioning Wales and Scotland are uh, have the ability to do much so much more they're sort of what that's where the the progress is coming from right now not on a national level. Well, Wales being an exception of Scotland, I think precisely because they are small, smaller countries, no, where there's more direct democracy. And, uh, and I think the challenge is also to how do we deal, deal with the so-called free trade treaties that then come in and undermine all that's happening. No, like, I mean, I would love to know how that would clash with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But um, I'll now, uh, shoot into the the many questions that we have and um let's see if we can lump some of them um one is here from ralph corgill who's saying how are we getting this information out that you've been sharing to he calls it the working pastors um, as the panthers say you know people are financially poorer um you know are they part of this transformation or do they get to hear about it um, and there's another question here which is kind of related because uh howard tank is saying local places even quite close places sometimes have different quantities uh, of resources and qualities and how are these issues dealt with you know if if we could become too localized so this is you know the thing about here you know wealth distribution and inequality how would we deal with that would any of you like to speak to this go ahead george i see you popped off mute but i'll i have some thoughts too okay, once okay. you're done i think it's the poorest people who can benefit greatest from local from localization and uh so I think it's getting that message across and, um, and, and electing the people 
who uh, believe in in localism, um, and uh, so uh, both both in the local communities, in the town councils, in the city councils, in the neighbourhood councils, um, and um, and so I think once there's an understanding that actually you get fairer communities where you get true localism, then I think you bring the uh, poorer communities in that you um, are absolutely rightly concerned about. And I think historically it is always the poorer communities who are left out of these conversations because they have less means to be involved in the conversation. So we really have to reach out to, um, have, that, to have that conversation. I, absolutely, and I do think, and one of the things we've been exploring in partnership with with many um, activist groups and, and movement organizers is is political education strategies and really getting the word out there. That said, I, I do want to sort of go back to something that George you said in your initial presentation that in fact, you know, a lot of of change already comes from communities that um, have been marginalized and. Um, disenfranchised and, and pushed aside uh, the quote unquote poorer places, as, as George said earlier, are often uh, the richest culturally and, and community wise places. And a lot of the, the things that, um, you know, we talk about when we talk about community wealth building, these aren't necessarily new strategies. These are strategies that communities and particularly communities that have been marginalized have been using to service their their economic and and place based needs for for millennia cooperatives right so people have been cooperate cooperating to meet their their economic needs all over the place and in fact a lot of our modern examples grow out of examples from um you know uh the global south um uh, a lot of our community wealth building theory is rooted in uh, places like Ujama socialism in Tanzania, um, a lot of the efforts in participation and participatory democracy that come out of places in South America, um, and in fact, the, the networked cooperative model in, in um, the United States in Cleveland uh, grew out of Mondragon um, in the north of Spain, which um, certainly was, was a model in the face of sort of uh, Franco oppression and, and so forth that really helped uh, that region um, maintain not only its uh, cultural identity and autonomy, but, but also survive um, in, in extreme austerity and, and deprivation. So, so there, there's, a, you know, there's a lot in this that is already growing out of, of really the grassroots of, of, of places. And, and now as we sort of like begin to have this movement cohesion, we need to ensure that there are feedback loops and, and, and ways of of in including that enable people to be at the table. Um, you know, when you have participatory uh, planning or budgeting sessions, you need to be able to provide daycare. You need to be able to provide, um, you know, uh, uh, compensation for, for work hours and things like that, as you've seen in places like Brazil and others in, in different kinds of experimenting around, around those efforts. So, so there's, um, there's a lot that's already being done. There's a lot more that can be done. And I think, I think it's, it's not just how do you include poor communities, but how, how are we learning from them and building off of a lot of examples that they've already set? Yeah, if I, if I can come in on, on, on that, because I think um, one of the things that sometimes I, I, I feel um, uh, that good practice is a bad traveller. <laughs> <laughs> it's sometimes it's you know if it's the next door place to you then sometimes you feel a sort of resistance to uh, adopting and um and and i and i know that that's you know that sometimes it's a very good traveler but it's often a better traveler if there's a distance between project one and project two <laughs> particularly if there's a country border in between um but i i, th I think that the um what what is kind of very important for um, a country like Wales is Wales is the poorest part of the UK. You know, Wales was the country of industrialization. It was the country which signed the first million pound check in the coal exchange. But as I said in my initial introduction, all that wealth, all that health of its people were just taken away and the capital went elsewhere, not least to places like Bristol. So there's a, you know, there's a, a real and, and a lot of those communities, um, and I, I sort of slightly hesitate, but I've used the, the phrase sort of left behind um, in the book. And I mean left behind by the very reason they were first set up. 
and those communities are among the poorest of the poorest in a in a in a, in a poor country as it were um this is income um now and 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 you're working in brussels sarah and you'll know that you know previously west wales and the valleys um and uh, cornwall and parts of scotland um you know for example were places that were identified as the poorest part among the poorest parts of of europe and that's why i think that notion and it very much plays to what you're doing in the work of the democracy collaborative that notion that for the first time through skyline those communities are looking at how they might do it uh, when there's been 20 years of when I've been involved, as it were, of watching government try and find ways of creating community wealth building opportunities, but but more doing it to the community rather than the community taking ownership of the outcome. And I think that's a really um, interesting model. I mean, if they manage to pull this off and they and in their case, what they have is potentially a massive forestry resource. Um, which could be used in the context of timber, but could be used in very, very many other ways um, as well. So that's a different uh, uh, you know, financial resource available to them. But we also know sometimes communities, um, un, you know, unfortunately in this debate, make the choices that we wouldn't want them to make. And going back to George's car point, I was really, really excited that um, in our capital city of Cardiff, that one of the first things the council did when we had COVID was to shut the main street uh, in front of the Cardiff Castle and create all sorts of open air venues where people could be sufficiently far apart to be able to be safe. And uh, the council has just announced that it's going to reopen it. And as George said, it's the, it's the car driver lobby. And although they're going to keep it as a pedestrian one during the summer, in the autumn they're going to open it again and you just think that actually if all those people in that car driver lobby really understood the impact of their cars on the air in the city um on on children in particular are their carbon emissions you know i bet they 55 percent of those car drivers would not have voted to reopen that city center but they just don't want to add 10 15 minutes to their journey so there is something about the point that you made about Sarah about education and learning is needed and we've had two climate assemblies now in Wales in some other uh, other parts of those South Wales valleys and each one has come up with exactly the same kind of recommendations that deliver on the well-being of future generations act when those communities who've never felt asked or involved have had the chance to really debate these issues with experts so that issue around learning is absolutely critical otherwise we will get those short-term um, decisions still when the people are involved in in the discussion so i think there's almost like a mandatory learning for us all before you put the proposition so people have a real understanding of the implications um, and I, I, th I just I, I wonder if you've got evidence there about how that changes outcomes that you can share um, with us in the chat so we can all have a look. Can I quickly say, I think that's a tragic example about the, the what you call the reopening, what I call the closing of the street, because I think local people would envisage that what happened during COVID is that street got opened. It got opened to people. It became a place, it became a real place. It became yeah. something that was very much part of the, the, the local community. And what they're doing now is closing it again. And I think the language of change is often so negative. And I think part of what could come out of good localism is, is a, a slightly different way of describing things. So yeah, and to I'll, that point, I just popped in the chat how important it is to do that education and, and have that learning, but rooted in, in possibility, right? I think so often people hear about what's wrong, but they don't know what the alternative is. They don't know how to do it differently. They don't know how to think in solutions. And so that is why places like Preston are important, because even though it's not replicable, even though it may be very different from your own situation, it does show that you can do things differently. And that's really important for people to know about, to know about those alternatives. Um, 
so before we'll move on to another question, and uh, uh, I just want to insert a, a, a comment of my own from my own experience. So uh, from what I, for example, my work here in Mexico, where I work with a lot of uh, rural communities and campesinos, farmers, peasants, and uh, what I've seen, uh, one of the, which could be a little bit akin to the kind of the poorer segments of society that Ralph is alluding to, is that you often, it's the best way to get a conversation going. It's not like go out and hold a meeting or have an educational campaign directing just at those people, is to create spaces where you can do things together. So it kind of where spaces where kind of horizontal community building can take place. So that can be a community garden, and it can be, you know, allotments, it can be uh, the kind of, in the cities, these kind of repair cafes where you get people from all corners of life, different generations getting together, doing something practical, and out of that becomes a raised consciousness. So that's one thing I think it's probably, you know, really undervalued, but creating those spaces will make, transform a community in itself. It will build a community. Yeah? And the other thing I've also had sort of personal experience with in Denmark is being, uh, you know, randomly picked to be part of a citizen assembly that was discussing a really controversial issue, a tax on meat, which in Denmark, you know, is a, an issue that could really rile up a lot of people. And I was sitting there with people from every political spectrum. I was sitting with a, you know, next to me was a pig producer you know, that had, you know, that produced thousands of pigs and, you know, and we, after six hours of sitting down at a table, came up with a policy recommendation, which could have been, you know, on the Green Party's, uh, you know, a Green Party's policy recommendation. It was quite astonishing. So, I mean, that's another uh, um, tool or process, I think, that can also get a lot of people involved. So um, anyway, those were some comments from myself. I think we didn't quite get to, I mean, Howard's um, question about like, well, could localization lead to some kind of competition between communities? You know, uh, from my point of view, I would have thought we'd need some kind of a national level wealth distribution. We can't just, you know, leave whoever is more marginalized to their own destiny, you know? Anyone wants to? Sarah, you look like you have something to say. Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. I, I think, you know, I think sometimes people think of localization um, only in a vacuum and, and it has to, you have to think of these things in, in tiers and, and, and in sort of subsidiarity, right? And what can you do at the lowest possible level, but understanding that there are things that you can't necessarily do at that level that you also need to have regional or national or, or other supportive frameworks around those things at the same time. Um, uh, and absolutely in terms of sort of distribution of, of resources, um, but thinking of those in terms of need as well. I mean, one of the the live discourses in the UK, um, and I'm sorry to keep speaking to UK examples, is, is the notion of devolution and leveling up. And what does that actually mean? And what, what would that really look like if you were to take into account the, the real sort of regional inequities that are rife um, with, with, within and across the UK? Um, so you need to be able to have those kinds of conversations at those levels. But then, you know, when you start to sort of move away from uh, the sort of global trade regimes and, and st what, what would, you know, you can't necessarily put the, the genie back in the bottle, right? We still live in a globalized world. So how can we think about um, solidaritous relationships rather than competitive relationships between places, right? How could we have, sol you know, solidarity between communities uh, and economies that are rooted in place, between local and, and trade um, relations in in solidarity as ways um, to to meet need based on need, and I think that's sort of the framework you have to think of, not just within your own locality, but but within your own region and country, and then ultimately globally. And that that's how you need to think about you know need and distribution um, and and what that looks like, and 
repairing uh, and think of it from a reparative frame too and, and repairing past inequalities and, and oppressions and things and, and what would that look like um, when you have a, a, a global view on things. That there's a time, you know, there's a time, and, and, and that, this goes with the growth conversation too, right? Um, it's not necessarily degrowth, but we don't need to be growing in certain places. And, and how, how does that play into an actual genuine conversation around leveling up? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's absolutely um, spot on. And I think the, the, um, one of the reasons that in Wales, unusually, uh, those five ways of working that play very well to the eight principles that um, uh, Sarah outlined earlier were included in the law is partly to address that issue. So if you've got a principle of collaboration um, that is in law now that you have to demonstrate, it makes it very different to that sort of competitive element. Um, and I think that also it's that point about learning, you know, making good practice a good traveller that if you have to collaborate, actually it changes what the project is. So some, you know, person A goes in thinking the project's going to be this <laughs> uh, in, in, the, in the old autocratic ways, um, or organisation A, because it quite often is a, an organisation, um, but actually it becomes changed and better for that collaborative input, particularly uh, also a critical element that is by involving people about who, whom those decisions are being made. So those two elements then tied to the fact you have to be preventative and you have to think long term means that actually there can be a test. There will be legal tests of this undoubtedly over the next few years about whether organisations are demonstrating that. This is a very, very different approach in the context of, for example, the UK government at the moment has rewarded those seats which changed from red to blue um, with substantial amount of funding. And I have never seen that before, actually, in my you know, sort of political life. I've never seen that done so blatantly that it is a direct political outcome. If you vote blue under the UK government at the moment, you get money. Whereas normally in my political life, it's always been, you know, trying to find the formula that is fairest to the largest number of people. And I think there is something longer term about the trust that people have in their governing institutions is also very important here. That idea that if you vote one way, you'll get something for your community will end up um, uh, encouraging some people to take that choice. But if as a result, the rest of the whole of the UK is poorer, that is not gonna play out. So I think that you know it's far better to be stronger in the impact, which we're all agreed on, and the stronger in the impact of how bringing that money back home that hundred million pounds brought back into the economy of West uh, of Preston. You know, we can already see money coming back home in Wales as a result of more local initiatives. And I think that's the big agenda is your pound um, needs to be the maximum opportunity for the pound to be spent locally for local people should be exercised. But local is going to mean something different in terms of the different services and delivery mechanisms um, because I can tell you where I live you can't grow that much food <laughs> so we definitely need local to be a lot bigger than my particular part of sheep grazing West Wales so local is going to vary but actually that principle in the context of global is critical yeah. and I, I think the implication of the question is somehow that localism is isolation and it's selfish localism is far from isolation it may be a direction of travel and i think that it leads to greater generosity and understanding of other people's needs so um i just want to kill that because i've sometimes you know been told that localism is inward looking it's little island thinking um i think localism is actually creates good globalism of, of uh, very differently from the sort of very controlled globalism that we have. 
I think World Localization Day is a very good example of this because, you know, we've got people here uh, as part of this campaign from 29 countries, you know, hosting conversations about localization, you know, a global to local shift and, and linking up with us in other parts of the world to get, you know, good tips and how did you deal with this? How do you do with that? You know, and having really critical conversations about something that, you know, is in a way new to us, not localization itself, because obviously we as humans have evolved in connection with place, but how do we deal with a situation of, you know, the gene that's out of the bottle, you said, Sarah, you know, it, it, we haven't faced the, uh, uh, the situation we are in now with, with such a globalized economy, which goes beyond anything we saw under colonial times, you know? And I think, uh, before we move on to the next question is that one can never go back to the way things were but we so maybe we can't put the gene back into the bottle but that we have to regulate the global economy global finance global trade I think there's no question about that we're not going to be having any community wealth building we're not going to have strong local economies we're not even going to have to have a planet to live on for the future if we don't do that at least that's how I see it. So I think that is something that we have to grow into that role. No, we have to learn, you know, we are learning as we are on this ride that's happening so fast now. And, but we, as kind of activists and community wealth builders and placemakers, people, wherever we are, you know, this is something we have to learn to deal with, we have to find ways of working together towards that. Now, uh, here, there's just a comment from someone called Joel van der Wagen, uh, who actually mentions a TV series, I don't watch a lot of TV, that says the life-size city, it's a world tour of placemaking within big, big cities. If you, I don't know if any of you know about, about that, or Jane Jacobs' books, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. So if maybe if any of you, or any of you three know, maybe you can answer that in in the in the chat box if you like you know and i think uh, uh, i got curious joel now i want to go back and check it out because it sounds really interesting um and then brian has a question here about would a carbon tax or would carbon taxes be helpful or are they essential what are your thoughts about this uh and and uh you were also saying before uh, um, George, about how, you know, if local government can't control their taxes, you know, how are we going to do any kind of localization, you know? So, but carbon tax, helpful, essential, what are your thoughts on this? I think it's the most essential thing to tax. I mean, it is, uh, you know, taxation that's used to change behavior is the best taxation. And, uh, and so I think it's a win-win. You get, you get more money and you get better behavior. Simple as that. And I think there's something to add to that, which is, um, I absolutely agree, by the way. I mean, I think that uh, there has been a, um, a sort of spurious deferral of any proper discussion about a carbon tax and um you know if it, if we end up in another cop 26 i mean i've i was at cop 15 16 17 18 <laughs> 19 and there, I mean, there are lots of really enthusiastic people talking about carbon taxes and they just don't get there and but actually we need it and that will tackle the big corporates in that in in that sense but there are three other things i think we need as well one is we need that activism that actually goes for the pension funds we need that activism that goes for the boards of those big companies because i think the door is open as never before and now that we've got the international energy association basically downgrading all the assets of the fossil fuel companies there is a moment where if the politicians don't seize this, they will have let us down in a way that, an even bigger way than they've let us down so far. And the last bit of this, I think, is, and it goes back to this point about learning. I still find that I talk to highly educated people who have very, very clear views about wanting to live more sustainably, who do not yet understand their own impact on the planet. And I do think that actually 
carbon budgeting at an individual level um, could be a very, very good, good tool, probably voluntary to start with, but a very, very good tool for people to understand which parts of their behaviour um, create problems in the context of, of climate. Because when you send people off to do a carbon footprint or an ecological footprint or, or anything else, they often come back and they're deeply shocked to find that they thought that because they recycled, <laughs> i.e. treating waste as a resource, that actually it meant that they could happily get on a flight twice a year to go on holiday. Um, for And I think it's, a, it's, it's in, in enabling people to understand it's that learning. So there is a, a combinations there, but primarily um, if we don't end up with a carbon tax out of this COP, um, our chances of achieving the Paris outcomes that we would want to achieve are absolutely zero. And don't get me started on net zero either. <laughs> so, zero is where we should be going. Three on, on the carbon tax. Um, we are the, uh, another area we need to go after are the insurers as well. That's actually a big a big part of changing the behavior. But to sort of your point, Anna, Anya, we, I think we absolutely need to stop the bad behavior. You know, we need to, that's the first thing to do. I mean, my orientation is, is redesign. What, how, how can we do it differently? But, but we can't even get to the redesign until we stop the bad behavior. So we just, we, we have to stop the bad behavior first. Um, and I think we need to do it by, by all means necessary. I mean, we've uh, offered some, you know, provocative uh, ideas, for example, nationalizing the fossil fuel companies and then breaking them apart. Um, and there's some some thinking on that, not that that's politically feasible anytime soon, but but those kinds of ideas to actually really stop um, um, the bad actors. And ultimately, I think we need to be looking at, um, you know, legally reconfiguring uh, the corporation as, as a body. Um, and there are many different ways to do that. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but, but ultimately we need to stop the bad acting and then and the bad behavior and, and the extraction. And then we can start to rethink about how we, how we can rebuild these things because we created them. And, and I mean, I think one of our biggest challenges is a challenge of imagination. I think we are so stuck in our in, our, in the way the world is that it's hard for us to see the way the world could be. And and we we created where we are. We can recreate it, and we absolutely have to. Um, and and we see that in place, you know, all over the world. Um, and now we need to believe in it and and move it forward. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, uh, one of the things that we do at Local Futures is try to help people imagine a different world, not just imagine it, but showing what's already happening. So we don't only have to imagine it, we can draw on it. So we have something like a library on Local Futures website, which is called Planet Local, which uh, had, uh, you know, shows a lot of these initiatives all around the world. And um, I, I feel that is one of the most important things that all of us can do because people, as you say, Sarah, have a really difficult uh, yeah, time find, thinking that another way is possible, even though it's happening. But we don't hear, hear about it in the mainstream media. So it's like up on the soapbox and share it with others, you know, so that we can start to imagine and not only imagine, draw from the lessons that are already happening. Uh, uh, here we have a, a, a question from Rita who says, uh, to what extent does activism and rebellion play a part in localism, i.e. resisting neg negative national and regional legislation and pushing ahead with initiatives that benefit local people, even if it's against the regulation? No? Uh, so any thoughts on this? Should we rebel even when, when the legislation is wrong and should we move I'm ahead? Really proud. I'm really proud to live in a very rebellious city. We, we, um, you know, <laughs> and we have historically been a rebellious city for the 18th, 19th century and the removal of the Colson statue recently. And um, I think uh, rebellion is a really important start for change often. 
Um, I think it was a really important for start for change about attitudes about the inner cities, although um, with this, you know, there's further still to go. So yes, I think um, we should uh, welcome rebellion, especially now on the climate front and extinction rebellion, more strength to your arm. And I think just a, another kind of rebellion, actually, it, we just witnessed in the UK in the last couple of days, which was when a, a, a conservative majority of 16,000 was overturned by a Liberal Democrat uh, campaigning on the protection of the area of outstanding natural beauty against the incursion of HS2, which is the high speed train proposal. And I thought was really, really interesting um, about that is the government is already running scared in terms of the way it was going to um, develop planning legislation, only for England, by the way, because it's devolved in Scotland and Wales. So there can be the kind of rebellions, and I support Extinction Rebellion in, uh, in my local area, there can be the kind of rebellions that many of us have participated in, whether it was against the war in Iraq or anything else. Um, and of course, the suffragettes that predated us, but you know, they, they, they did. And then, no, I wouldn't be here now if it weren't for the suffragettes and uh, franchise it for, for women. But there's also those rebellions within the system that are actually sometimes incredibly useful because they make it absolutely clear that the government's priorities, particularly when it was riding roughshod over people, were not the priorities of the people. So I think there's something incredibly important that can be harnessed there. And I'll just simply say, yes, of course we need rebellion. This is, you know, this is not a either or, or it's, it's a both and. We need, we need everything. At this moment, we need everything. We need rebellion. We need bottom up solutions. We need local solutions. We need regional solutions. We need legislative change. We, we need political action and political change. We need it all. Um, and we need to find a way to, to connect it all as well. I think, I think our biggest problem is not, you know, what, what to do, but how to connect it. I think there are so many ways to get involved, so many ways to make change, but we need to really make sure we're, we're connected to one another and, and moving um, uh, in the same direction or in the right direction. So, so that, that's the challenge, but, but we need it all. Thank you. Uh, I can't tell you how pleased I am about this conversation because it's, it's been very stimulating. I've learned a lot of new things and I think a lot of people will get to benefit from what has been discussed and shared here today. Uh, we have uh, reached the 90 minute mark, passed it. Would you like to say a departing comment? What, all of you? Any of you? Um, I I'll think just we say know. thank you. It was, and um, thank you and keep, keep the fight. Keep up the good fight, everybody. Absolutely. Sorry, George. And, and let's revitalize our democracies so that they're true democracies. Yeah, and I, and I just think my, my last comment is, if you think what you're doing is right, don't be scared. Just get on and do it. Because I, I, what I learned through my long political life is to avoid allowing people to say no to me. <laughs> it's a very good political tool in terms of delivering outcomes. So uh, don't ask for permission. You've got the permission to think differently. Use it and create those new opportunities. Because as Sarah said, we need it all. <laughs> we need it all and we need everybody. Thank you so much. I hope we meet again. Good evening, good afternoon. In person good morning. one day. <laughs> yes, in Thank person. You. No, no, this could continue. I'd really love to. So much more I want to touch upon. <laughs> Thank you to everybody. Thank you to the listeners. And thank you to all the people that will see this afterwards. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.